Hello and welcome to UGC e Shala project. I am Dr. Tulika Sanadhya in Geography Department, teaching at Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar College of University of Delhi. Today I am going to present a module on transportation in cities. Let's begin with learning objectives. Importance of transportation in location. Importance of an efficient and effective transport system. Thirdly, we are going to study stages of development of transport in urban areas. Fourthly, we are going to talk about transportation problems. And finally, we are going to talk about transportation solutions. Let's begin with the introduction. Transport is an important sector of the urban system. An efficient transport system facilitates the smooth functioning and development of the cities. It can be regarded as an engine driving the economic growth of the cities in the world. Similarly, the development of better transportation system in cities, periphery are responsible for the phenomena of urban sprawl. The issue of transportation is more intricate in nature in developing countries. It is mainly due to increasing population and haphazard development of cities in these countries. The complexities can be understood from the fact that transport sector not only includes the issues pertaining to efficient transport design, but also equitable mobility of passengers, optimum freight movement and amelioration of existing congestion. In the light of the above discussion, it is important to delve deeper into the issues related to transportation in cities. Today's lecture is divided into four sections. First section deals with the classical theories pertaining to importance of transportation in location. Second section highlights the importance of an efficient and effective transport system. In the section three, the focus is on the stages of development of transport in urban areas. Section 4 covers transportation problems and the last section provides transport solutions. Let's begin with our first section, transport and location. Many geographers have given importance to transportation, which affects the location of urban land use, agricultural fields and industry. Von Thunens in 1826, in his theory of agricultural land rent and use, focused on land rent, commuting cost, and the cost of all other goods and services. Urban forms are influenced due to transport networks as there is a segregation of places of housing and workplace. Income of the household determines the choice of housing. For example, Higher income groups prefer to stay in the peripheral areas to avoid congestion and that they can do because of their affordability to have their private vehicles. On the other hand, the low income groups prefer to stay close to the city to minimize the cost of the transportation. Central place theory by Walter Christoller in 1933 predicts that if the transportation cost declines then consumers will travel to greater distances to acquire goods and services. It is mainly due to the size of the market centers, which is determined by the range, that is maximum distance a consumer would travel in order to buy goods and services, and threshold, which is minimum population required for any production to take place, which determines the size of the market center. Further, the transport principle proposed by the Christoller states that an urban settlement is most preferred if minimum transportation cost is incurred upon the consumers. The reduction in transportation costs can disperse the population of urban centers since consumers will be more willing to travel to longer distances. 
Likewise, Weber in 1909 used transport as one of the variable in determining the location of the industries. The industries are located at a point where the minimum cost is incurred in aggregating raw material and distribution to the market. Now my second section is on importance of transportation system in which we are going to first talk about transportation and urbanization. There is a bi-directional relationship between transportation and urbanization. The segregation of land use over space causes the demand for movement which in turn result into further segregation of land use in the cities. It is mentioned in Carter 1995. The relationship has become more complex due to high pace of urbanization coupled with increasing availability and affordability of transport modes in cities. Urban mobility problems have increased proportionally and in some cases exponentially with urbanization since mobility demands are concentrated over a specific area. Since 1950, the world's urban population has more than doubled to reach nearly 3.5 billion in 2010, about 50.6% of the global population. This data was presented in Roderick 2013. Transportation as a response to greater urbanization in cities affects the spatial patterns of cities, which in turn influences the production, consumption and distribution of goods and services. It is also noteworthy when the transportation infrastructure is developed to meet the demand of the urban areas, definitely the demand is high from large cities or urban cities, the peripheral areas also get reinforcement for this development. This leads to the expansion of urban activities in the peripheral areas, leading to suburbanization process. Therefore, urban transportation is important to understand the morphology, size, density and land use of urban areas and the spatial pattern of urban functions. Transport opportunities and travel constraints give shape to the city while the structure of the city affects the form and character of the transport, as being said by Short in 1984. The given figure 1 shows that a transport system affects the accessibility in the cities, which in turn affects the urban land use. This change in land use generates the different activity pattern of the population that in turn influences the flows in the transportation system. The interconnection between the cities and their respective hinterlands and city and the metropolitan area are largely dependent on the efficient transportation system. A transportation system thus facilitates economic and social mobility which in turn accelerate urbanization and economic growth. Further, Transport sector creates millions of job opportunities for the people by way of creating demands for materials and equipment used for this industry. Now let's talk about transportation and economic development. The transportation stimulates economic mobility. It rearranges the economic ties between cities and their periphery. The demand for transport materials and equipment is to strengthen economy of a region by creating industries, catering to it and also by creating employment opportunities. The laying down of transport routes is also one of the important sectors for absorbing the workforce. Thus changes can be seen in the spatial economy. This relationship between economy and transport fructifies in three ways as shown by Ramachandran in figure 2. The model of transport and economy linkages shows that there are mainly three types of linkages which are as follows. Lateral linkage, it is a linkage of economy and transportation at a particular point in time. They do not follow the same scale of growth. Relationship is dynamic and grows with time. Second is vertical linkage. 
It is a subsequent development of transportation on the basis of previous developments in transportation and economy. The change is dependent on socio-political, economic and geographical factors. The third linkage is transverse linkage. It is the consecutive development of transportation and economy on the basis of lags and leads of each other from the previous stage. Now let's talk about some case studies. First is Delhi Mumbai Industrial Corridor DMIC. The ambitious DMIC project of Government of India which was envisaged on 1499 kilometers of western dedicated freight corridor of railways is an attempt to develop infrastructure and industry along the route of the corridor. This corridor runs through Dadri Uttar Pradesh to Jawaharlal Nehru port in Mumbai. Through this port, the government of India wants to create an industrial hub having the lowest manufacturing cost in the world. The project initiated in December 2006. It will cover six states with Uttar Pradesh, Haryana, Rajasthan, Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh and Maharashtra. Other projects of the similar nature under different stages are Chennai Bangalore Industrial Corridor, Bangalore Mumbai Economic Corridor, Eastern Coast Economic Corridor, Amritsar Kolkata Industrial Corridor. My second case study is on Delhi Metro Rail. It was constituted to decongest the roads of Delhi and which started a run for 22.06 kilometers in 2002. At present, it covers 204 kilometers covering Delhi and the satellite cities of Faridabad, Gurgaon, Noida and Ghaziabad. The development of the metro has not just eased the movement of people but has also given momentum to further urban sprawl. The covering up of Delhi metropolitan area towns will go a long way in penetrating urban growth inside the surrounding states. Now my next section is on growth of transport in cities. The form and character of the transport affects the internal structure of the cities. Suburban growth in recent times has become a reality due to the improved transportation facilities. Expansion of built up areas in the cities has been a result of efficient transport network. Urban forms of the cities have been restructured due to the increasing transportation infrastructure. The stages of transport evolution are easily recognizable in developed countries. On the other hand, in developing countries, due to haphazard development of cities itself, heterogeneous population and transport modes, the development of transport is not sequential, rather it is very haphazard. As you can see in the following series of graphs in figure 3 that how the built up area of the city in western countries is expanding from a stage of the pedestrian to a public transport to that of a early motor transport and finally to a fully developed private motorization. My next section is on urban transportation problems. First I'll discuss congestion. Congestion is mainly due to the growth in the number of vehicles and limitation of expansion of roads capacity. Due to rise in travel demand, the numbers of vehicles have increased in the cities. Further, due to lack of good mass transport system, there is a surge in private vehicles. Figure 4 depicts that car ownership and its use have increased considerably over the period with the increase in the road infrastructure thereby leading to congestion in the long run. According to Short, in 1984, the large areas there is a segregation of activities. As the distribution of activities has become further separated and public transport has declined, then accessibility has become increasingly a function of car ownership. In developing countries such as India, there is also a high growth of two-wheelers due to factors related to increase in income levels, economical pricing and requirement of little space for parking. 
table 1 reflects that the number of registered two wheelers and cars in india are increasing every year congestion is further worsening by poor design of roads which do not allow segregation of vehicles traveling vastly at different speeds this was referred in agrawal 2006 as both the motorized and non motorized vehicles are operating on the roads the speed of the vehicles gets reduced leading to congestion lack of finances and presence of land use on either side of the roads also constrain the expansion of roads the problem of congestion is further aggravated in developing countries due to the non segregation of work hours it leads to peak hour traffic congestion on roads now my next section is on inefficiency of public transport system there is a general decline in the public transportation system due to rise in the personal motor vehicles the main reasons for the non acceptance of public transport are its lack of comfort poor frequency poor accessibility lack of flexibility for commuting poor maintenance and so on figure 5 reveals that the persons share of vehicles in total registered vehicles in india depicts low and declining share of buses the share of two wheelers on the other hand show rapid growth now we will talk about declining importance of non motorized system it is another major problem as it doesn't provide a link to the public transport system which facilitates long journeys further there is no dedicated cycle lane for the commuters which are accident prone due to their low speed now the next problem is neglect of pedestrians on roads the planning of the city only considers the roads and motor car planning and it lacks the facilities for pedestrians walking can be important for short distances provided there are safety measures and conveniences for the walkers thompson in 1971 also stated most of the people professionally responsible for urban transport are car owners the most powerful transport authorities are usually highway engineering departments as quoted in short in 1987 my next problem is parking facilities which is seen in urban areas an increasing number of cars on the road would mean a greater space occupied by them subsequently a lack of space compels people to park their vehicles on the road sides which further creates traffic congestion problem another problem is noise and atmospheric pollution a consistent growth in vehicles has adverse impact on the environment there is an increase in the levels of sulfur dioxide nitrous oxide and fine particulate matter in the cities due to the emissions from motorized vehicles highest air pollution levels are observed during peak hour period and at traffic signals Table 2 shows that the average annual level of particulate matter is very high in the Indian cities. Almost all cities were showing above average levels of fine particulate matter. The levels of sulfur dioxide are within limits except Kalyan Domi Valley while that of nitrous oxide deviates in few of the cities namely Delhi, Kolkata, Navi Mumbai, Jaipur, etc. Another major problem is accidents. Road deaths and casualties are one of the serious problems faced by the urban dwellers. There are increasing numbers of deaths on roads due to accidents. In India, pedestrians and two-wheelers are worst hit in road casualties. Do you know as per Center for Science and Environment report On an average, five person dies in road accidents every day in Delhi, in which four of them are either pedestrians or two wheelers riders. This was reported in Times of India, twenty four June two thousand fourteen. So another problem is divided responsibilities. 
As it can be seen in figure 6, the whole set of problems mentioned above are the result of poor coordination between the central and the state authorities who are responsible for transport in urban areas. There is no integral planning for urban transport, causing delays, confusion, disputes and poor accountability. It hampers the development of transport in urban areas. Now we'll talk about transport solutions. First is integrated transport and land use planning. It will enable efficient movement and consequent less congestion on roads and containment of travel demand. Workplaces and residences should be planned together. Self-contained small clusters are desirable in the city region. Transport corridors must be designed prior to any land use planning. According to Agarwal in 2006, since shifting residences and employment is a difficult task in developing countries due to complicated buying and selling of houses, high rentals and limited supply of rental accommodation, therefore there is a need to pay attention on these aspects. Second solution is optimal modal mix. Preferences should be given to each mode of transportation as the people are using different modes depending upon their economic conditions. It is a well-known fact that high-income households rely on personal vehicles and low incomes on non-motorized modes. The main focus should be to make roads more equitable to people rather than increasing the provision of vehicles. However, according to Agrawal in 2006, it is important to consider the congestion impacts, emission characteristics and energy efficiencies to ensure sustainable mobility. Next solution is promotion of non-motorized modes. Non-motorized modes of transport which include cycle, rickshaw and walking are greener modes of travel. The use of these modes should be encouraged. To popularize these modes, segregated lanes should be designed as shown in figure 7. Further, it is essential to make improvements in the technology and make provision for safe parking for them. Next solution is improvement of public transport. Public transport should be made one of the preferred modes as it occupies less road space consumes less fuel and emits less fuel per passenger per kilometer travel in comparison to personal motor vehicles. Mass rapid transit system that is bus rapid transit system BRTS, metro, monorail, light rails should be encouraged. In India, BRTS is running in cities of Ahmedabad, Delhi, Jaipur, Indore, Rajkot, Surat, Vijayawada and Pune. Metro Rail is functioning in Delhi National Capital Region, Kolkata, Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai and Jaipur. Mono Rail is operative in Mumbai. Planning is going on for other cities of Chennai, Kolkata and Coimbatore. Strategies should be devised to promote public transport system and non-motor mode while discouraging the personal motor vehicles. Fifth solution is Discouraging personal motor vehicles, this can be achieved by fiscal and control measures. Fiscal measures include fee for using certain crowded part of the city, high parking fees, increasing vehicle registration charges and increasing tax on fuel etc. Control measures include physical restriction on the use of personal vehicles on busy transport corridors limiting the availability of parking space in city center, limiting the availability of road space for personal vehicles, restricting the ownership of vehicles. These were stated in Agarwal 2006. Some of the effective control measures are congestion charges, which was levied in London and Singapore. The congestion charges are levied based upon the time, which is peak hour period and location, that is busy corridors for running the vehicles. Quota based system and certificate for entitlement scheme for vehicle ownership is practiced in Singapore. 
Sixth solution is monitoring pollution levels. With the promotion of public transport and non-motorized modes and discouragement of private transport, the vehicular emission per person could be reduced. However, this should be in consonance with improved vehicular technology, use of cleaner fuels and taking off the obsolete vehicles from the roads. National Green Tribunal NGT, of India has banned vehicles older than 15 years. According to a report published in Indian Express 2nd December 2014, this will take away 29 lakh vehicles from the roads of Delhi. Supreme Court of India has also supported NGT's decision on the ban on older vehicles. It was reported in Indian Express 21st April 2015. Another noteworthy decision to reduce the pollution levels in Delhi by NGT is ordering commercial vehicles entering Delhi to pay environmental compensation charge over and above the municipal toll tax. Further, with the direction of Supreme Court on a public interest litigation in 1998 asking for running of buses, three-wheelers and taxis on compressed natural gas, CNG as alternative fuel by 2001. It has helped in reducing the pollution levels of Delhi in early 2000s. This was reported in Times of India, 9th November 2011. The need of the R is to adopt and promote biofuels such as ethanol, biodiesel, green diesel, etc. Another important measure is adopting coordinated planning measures. The figure 9 depicts that various agencies responsible for transport and traffic management should work in close coordination. There should be high level statutory body which is representative of all the agencies working in the field of transport planning. In the background of this, Unified Metropolitan Transport Authority, UMTA, as suggested by planners, should be constituted. With this, I conclude my presentation today. Urbanization is a continuous process and the problems of transportation is one of the crucial aspects to be dealt in urban areas. The gap between the demand and supply for transportation facility should be minimized with proper planning and policy intervention. There should be a paradigm shift towards adopting sustainable measures in a city, transport planning. Promotion of non-motorized vehicles and giving the due regards to pedestrians would make the city structure a sustainable for living. With this, I end my presentation. Thank you for your listening. Hope you have enjoyed this presentation. Thank you.